I thought she gave an incredible performance. It's too meta yeah. <laughs> to say like how she played me. I was just curious, when reading your book and then hearing you speak now, something that seems to stand out is your sense of agency and self and being able to mm -hmm. maintain control no matter at what point you are in your own story. And especially when publishing your book, it felt like you were trying to regain, con regain control of your narrative and your story in this huge web. So when you started to pitch it to the director and to make this movie, do you feel like as it translated into film and came, became part of like directors and writers, you lost some of that agency or was it almost evolving into a new form of control? Great question. Um, when Aaron called me to tell me he was gonna write the movie, he said, I have good news and bad news. I'm gonna write the movie, you're gonna have zero creative control. And I said, okay, well I have semi bad news for you. I'm your only source material. <laughs> <laughs> so that led to this incredible opportunity of working with Aaron Sorkin for eight months, helping to craft this story. And this movie was so different than most movies uh, because it wasn't just a writer sitting in their office picturing how, uh, you know, th this story is to them. That movie on that screen was my life. We all sounded funnier and smarter because it's Sorkin dialogue. Um, and there were a couple, you know, sort of characters that could have been expanded more or, cre you know, I think his biggest creative liberty was with my LSAT score. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, it felt like the story that I saw in my head only better. And you got to be played by Jessica Chastain. Yeah. Did you work much with her? I, a couple times, yeah. Yeah. She's, she's down to earth, she's cool. Were you pleased with how she played you? It must be so strange, like, seeing your... It's so strange. I thought she did an incredible... I mean, I thought she gave an incredible performance. It's too meta yeah. <laughs> to say, like, how she played me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I would want her to play me for mm. life. Like, that'd be, you know, like... Yeah. <laughs> I think she gave a great performance. Thank you. Uh, this one. Yeah, it's good. It's It's really um, an interesting way to go about your life, knowing that you've had, you know, very few people have lived an interesting enough life to have it be made into a major motion picture. So um, I'm curious to know if that's influencing, like, your next steps in life. When you walk into a room, you know that, you know, there's probably a good number of people who know your life story and they have, you have no idea who they are. You <laughs> may be on a flight and you probably have seen people watching it beside you and they mm -hmm. have no idea. So what's that like and how is that kind of driving your next steps in life? Um, if, if it influences at all. And then my second question are, either of your brothers single? <laughs> <laughs> um, both married. For the time being. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, when the movie came out, it was funny because when it all fell apart, almost everybody bounced except for a few people, and one of them is sitting in the audience right now, Taylor. Um, you, I, I got to find out who my friends were and who they weren't, and, and that's important information. Of course, when the movie came out, everyone came back, you know? And I kind of had this insight that it was time to go home, that I had, you know, I had come to this full circle of of being a nobody in Hollywood to having a premiere of my own movie and all the people, you know, wanted to be friends again. And I, I just knew it was time to go home. And so I, I moved back home to Colorado where most of my family is. And my everyday life has nothing to do with a movie or Jessica Chastain or, you know. <laughs> Um, the second part of your question is, has it w motivated you to, uh, you know, what, what, a, what about it motivates you? Well, I have this platform now, and I also have this knowing that just making money without a sense of purpose 
makes me miserable. And so always, since the time I was a little girl, I, I've had this deep passion to find my own power and to help other girls and women find theirs. Um, and that is what I want to spend my life doing. And um, I, I think about things a lot before I, before I build them. But I've gotten to this place where I think I know how to build something that could really move the needle on this. And the, in the short term, it's, it's you know, information, community, and mentorship. And in the long term, it's building uh, le leadership schools for young girls and uh, getting different legislation passed. But I think that I know the first step is building the uh, passionate, connected community. And, and that community, having them, you know, mentor, mentorship within. And, and so I'm really excited about this. Um, it already sounds exhausting. <laughs> and I have a two-year-old, which is the most exhausting. <laughs> but um, I don't feel like my life will be complete if I don't dedicate it, a, a, a big part of it to this. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's go in the front here. <clears throat> um, thank you for your brutal honesty. It's so refreshing. Yes. Um, you talked about your moral center and how you made decisions, micro decisions, leading away from, from your moral center. I'm curious how you rebuilt your self-trust, um, knowing you had the capacity to move away from that center and kind of reconcile those decisions. Yeah, I mean, I think the person that I'm most afraid of in life is that, is myself, because I saw you know, and I didn't even get into all of it. Like, I, I saw who we can become when we feed that part of ourselves. Um, and I think that's also why I have a lot of compassion for people who are behaving badly, uh, and why I want to normalize that um, it takes work and practice and education and 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 cultural requirements to stay good people. Um, it's not, I don't think it's something that we just naturally are, I think it's something to work on. And so, after the fallout, um, I, you know, I, I had the opportunity to be, to be mentored by a, a very great woman, and a deeply spiritual woman. Not religious, spiritual, and she said, Spirituality to me is, is, a, is a very practical thing. It's about practicing principles, trying to do the right thing, and taking constant inventory to see if you are who you say you are. And so, you know, that's a part of my life that I, I'd like to say I do it every day. I do it three to five times a week. And I, I look at, first I, you know, I, do some I did some writing on who I want to be and who I don't. And then I look at my day on that week and I, and, I, and I see, I look at it honestly. And I look at the places that I need to do a little work. And I look at the places where I'm doing well. And I stay sort of in that, that constant uh, inventory place. Because I know. <laughs> And I was like, I mean, I had an overgrown conscience when I was little. If I lied to my mom or dad, I would stay up all night. <laughs> and then here I am under federal indictment, you know, <laughs> <laughs> with a bunch of like mobsters. Um, that we contain multitudes, <laughs> you know. Thank you. Um, do we have any more? Yeah, I'm just there. <clears throat> um, thank you so much for sharing your story today. It's been great. I just wanted to ask, 
You mentioned that you grew up in a very male-dominated household, and then you entered into a very male-dominated game, and you sort of emerge from that now. And I wanted to ask what advice you might want to give to young women out there who are about to enter into maybe not a so male-dominated world now, but workplaces or industries and fields that might be more male-heavy and what we can do or just sort of any advice for young girls out there? <clears throat> there are two parts of this question, as I see it. Um, there is the necessity, and always has been, for institutions, people, laws to change, to give uh, more, uh, you know, to, to ensure more equality and, and everything. And those processes are long, and sometimes they move forward and sometimes they move back. Um, I believe it's important to support them uh, and do what you can. And then the other piece of that is, what are you personally going to do to get ahead? And so I think it's extremely powerful to look at the industry you're going into and look at the people that get ahead in it, right? What's their appetite for risk? What's your appetite for risk? What's their, what happens when they make a mistake? How quickly do they brush it off and, and get back in? You know, just some of these attributes. And then look at the places where we could get better, get stronger, get tougher. Um, because what I think the wrong answer is, is to wait for the world to change. And the right answer is that the world needs you to get in those, those seats. And I don't want to say whatever it takes because not whatever it takes, right? Don't let them take their name. You can still get ahead and get into those seats by being a nice person. But I think it requires getting really honest with yourself and, and, and looking at where can I make myself better? And, and then just day in and day out, I refuse to fail. This isn't just about me. This is about changing power paradigms and, and, and what's happening in the world. Thank you. That was a great question. Um, a very good answer as well. Um, I think, and this is one final question. Yeah, I think that's a good spot to end on, actually. Um, I do have one more question for you, though, which is one that we ask all of our guests. Um, uh. So all term we've had this answer. And that is, if you had to leave us with one thing to think about for the week, what would that thing be? It's quite a lot of pressure. So much pressure. <laughs> you didn't put that in the questions you sent me. No, sorry. <laughs> um. So one of the most, one of the hardest and one of the most powerful things that I ever did, and I did it as an act of survival. During that time that I lived with my mom, I had to do two, two really important things. I had to own responsibility for everything I did. And then I had to forgive myself fully. Let it go. And that took some work because there's something in our brain, and, and the research says especially women and especially teenagers, mm. who, don't, who have a really hard time letting it go. Mistakes of the past, you know, whatever. Um, so I would ask yourself, what do I need to let go of completely? What do I need to let go of? What am I holding on to that's just not serving me and not allowing me to, uh, you know, have a lighter load? Because you got to be really light, you know, um, to get there. Because there's going to be way more heaviness. <laughs> 
you don't need to be carrying your own. So, what do I need to forgive myself for and what do I need to let go of? Okay. Thank you so much. Can we all thank Molly for coming today? Thank you. And we'll head up. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry.